This lecture covers our patient assessment algorithm. This algorithm was developed to provide students with an organized, systematic means of learning patient assessment, applying patient assessment in the lab setting, and then taking that patient assessment system into the streets and apply that to real patients. We have, all the instructors have worked together. We all have slightly different variations of this, but overall we have, we do the same thing, we teach the same thing, and in the end our students walk out the door with the same tools to utilize in assessing patients. So let's work through this algorithm in our patient assessment algorithm our goal is to take the knowledge that we gain while we're in our EMT course then our advanced EMT course and our and our paramedic courses and use that as a framework to take that knowledge and apply it to patients. What is a clinician? A clinician is a person who has a body of medical knowledge and they have a mechanism for applying that knowledge to patients. This algorithm and the skills we teach you in lab are that mechanism that you utilize to go from being a person with a lot of medical knowledge to a clinician who can find a problem with the patient, recognize it, prioritize it, treat it, and transport that patient, and in the end, make a difference in that patient's life. Uh, they don't always live, but we give them the best chance that we can. So let's work through this algorithm just like we have in class. As you can see, my slide is all acronyms. I, I will flesh out those acronyms. We've been working with them. Uh, these should not be new things to you. So what do we do first? First we, thing we do is our primary survey. We're gonna start in that primary survey with scene size up and scene safety always. Scene size up. I approach a scene. I take in what I see. I identify potential threats such as hazardous materials, uh, potential violent situations, a riot in the street. I don't know. A man with a with a machete running naked down the street. Those are threats. There are any number out there. You can use your imagination now and you still wouldn't come up with the things you're going, that you're going to see in the streets. But uh, with recognize the things on the scene and, and determine where that scene safety scene is safe prior to entering. So scene size up, take it all in, use your education experience, your common sense to determine whether this is a stable scene that I should enter or whether I need to withdraw and get more help. A dead EMT and a dead paramedic do nobody any good. You just wind up with more patients and nobody and not enough people to treat them. So keep yourself safe, size up that scene, determine if that scene's safe. Now you can enter. Part of scene safety is your PPE. At a bare minimum, that, that would be gloves, exam gloves. Those exam gloves are part of your uniform when you approach a patient. Without that, in my mind, you're naked because you are, you are open to the elements and whatever might come your way. So wear those gloves. Chief complaint. This can change as we work through the assessment. Initially, that chief complaint in our minds on the way to the call is what have I been dispatched to? What am I responding to? Two, is it a five car pile up on the freeway or a sick call in a nursing home? 
these calls run the gamut. So you get in your mind what you're responding to, what do I need to be thinking about. Uh, child not breathing, okay, this is pediatrics. What do I need to remember that I that is different about kids, on and on. Uh, man with chest pain, possible heart attack. What questions do I need to ask? What do I need to do? That's chief complaint initially. Once you make patient contact, that could change. Okay. Now, uh, let me hit something else. I almost missed it. Mechani mechanism of injury, nature of illness. Uh, mechanism of injury, we may be able to see in our scene size up. This goes with trauma. Is there a little sports car wrapped around a telephone pole and a lifeless body on the ground beside the car? Are we dispatched to chest pain at a nursing home? That would be nature of illness. So medical calls nature of illness and trauma calls mechanism of injury. Remember always that medical problems can lead to trauma. The person who wrapped the car around the telephone pole could be a diabetic who took her insulin, she's, she's hypoglycemic, she loses consciousness and she blasts into that pole. And trauma can, can trigger a medical issue. You can have someone, and you will, I guarantee you that you will see this. You can have a patient, let's say, let's stick with car wrecks, somebody involved in a rear-end collision at a traffic light, and one of the occupants of one of the cars has a heart condition, and the stress of that situation causes that person to start having ischemic chest pain, and maybe that pain has shortness of breath with it. It feels like crushing chest pain, and it's radiating to the jaw and down the arm, but he also has a big laceration on his head where he hit the steering wheel when he was rear-ended. So trauma and medical aren't mutually exclusive. Look for both. That's what a good clinician does. As you approach your patient, we do our walking across the room assessment, through the door assessment, uh, approach assessment, whatever you want to call it, as I walk up to that patient. Do I see a conscious patient? Do I see a calm conscious patient? Do I see someone who's fighting to breathe and they look like they're in horrible distress? Do I see someone clutching their chest with their fists like they're having chest pain? Do I see someone who's unconscious, unresponsive? Oh, they're kind of grayish blue. It looks like they're not breathing. You can get a lot of information as you approach your patient, as you approach your scene. Now we're going to make patient contact. Hi, my name's Buddy. I'm an EMT. I'm here to help you. As I say that, I reach down and I grab bilateral radio pulses. And I'm not counting the pulse. I'm number one. I'm checking to see if they're there. Number two, I'm checking to see if it's really fast, if it's really slow, if it's strong and bounding, if it's weak and thready, or if it's not there at all. Important information. I look the patient in the eye. I'm asking a question that can't be answered with one word. Hi, I'm Buddy. I'm an EMT. I'm here to help you. Can you tell me what happened? That requires some interaction with your patient. That patient can then tell you what the problem is. If that patient speaks in one or two word broken up sentences and they're extremely short of breath, there's information that I need to have to treat this patient. I need to do something to help that breathing issue. Now I'm going to start down through these acronyms. I'm ready now to go through my A, B, C, D, E. Let's add an X above that for exsanguination to keep the pre-hospital trauma life support folks happy. That is not the National Registry standard yet, but I want you to be thinking about X for exsanguination. That means bleeding out, losing your entire blood volume. Exsanguination, think of massive bleeding. And if we find that, we have to find it, fix it, 
deal with it, whether we use a tourniquet, get somebody else holding direct pressure, whatever we have to do. We have to deal with that bleeding before we can move on because ABCD does no good if the person has no blood to oxygenate. Uh, does no good to provide a patient with an airway if they've if they've totally bled out. So let's add that X above. Now let's go airway. Does our patient have an open patent airway? Are the, is my patient breathing? Is that labored breathing? Is that calm breathing? Is it really rapid breathing? Is that patient breathing circulation? Did that patient have those radial pulses? That's all I need to know there. Is that circulation present? D is disability. Think about C-spine first here. If our mechanism of, in, of injury indicates a possible spinal injury for our patient, we need to have someone stabilize C-spine immediately, and they don't release that until we have a cervical collar, have that on the patient, have that patient on a backboard, fully secured, with a cervical mobilization device in place so that we could take a backboard and turn it up sideways, our patient would remain secure, their C-spine would be protected. So disability. Uh, and then exposure or environment is E. Is this patient home in a comfortable cool house at 70 degrees? Is, is this patient out in the heat in the middle of the day mowing the yard and suddenly began having chest pain. Is this did this person have a car wreck two hours ago and nobody was around to find them? They were driving in a blizzard, slid off the road, rolled their car, and they've been sitting out in the cold West Texas wind and snow for two hours, and now we have an exposure problem. It can be heat, it can be cold, they could be in a lake, they, they could be wherever you find your patient. What is the environment? What are the exposures? Now let's move on to level of consciousness. That is our AVPU acronym. We added a second A up there. Is our patient alert and appropriate as we make contact do they appropriately answer our questions as we begin interacting with them? Or are they alert but confused? Are they awake but totally out of it, totally inappropriate, can interact with us? Uh, next would be V for verbal uh, level of consciousness. Is that patient unconscious but then I say, hey Jim, wake up wake up and he opens his eyes and he starts talking to me again that's responding to verbal stimulus let's say that doesn't work they don't respond to they're not alert they don't respond to verbal stimuli now we're now we've made it down to P right that is painful stimulus that is that trapezius pinch possibly a sternal rub a pressure right up in the, the, the front of the skull, in the superior portion of the orbit, where that foramen is, that, where that nerve comes through that innervates part of the, of the forehead, that's a tender spot if you put pressure on it. You could put pressure there to elicit that painful response to see if they respond to pain. You could do a sternal rub. Some people get upset if they see you doing a sternal rub. In the back of my ambulance, that's probably my go-to. Uh, when I'm out in public, probably a trapezius pinch is my go-to. Uh, you could also pinch the nail bed with your, with your ballpoint pen that you carry in your shirt uh, to elicit that, that pain response. If they don't respond to pain, we're moving down the list, then they're unresponsive. That is something that we need to be concerned about. We need to determine whether or not that is normal for our patient. It could be that you respond to a nursing home and you learn that this patient is always unresponsive. 
Is there anything different about their level of unresponsiveness today? Uh, that's maybe they, maybe normally they're unresponsive, but they fidget around in the bed and they move around, but they don't really seem to interact with anyone and they don't really seem to respond to painful stimuli much. Today, they're flaccid in the bed, not moving at all. So that, that would be a change worth noting. Okay, as we have worked through this, do we need additional resources? Uh, do we need someone, an extra set of hands to help with extrication and firefighters rescue crew with the proper extrication, extrication tools? Do we need high angle rescue, somebody with ropes and a Stokes basket to go get our patient because they're on an incline too steep for us to approach? Do we need the hazmat crew? Do we need police? Are we in an, an environment that seems to be becoming unstable or have we realized we're in the middle of a crime scene and we need pol the police department here? Contact law enforcement. Dispatch will handle those things for you. But you have to recognize the need and communicate it before help comes. All right, so by this point, we should have interacted enough with our patient to start getting an idea whether we have a critical patient or a non-critical patient. What do we call that? Our, the general impression of the patient. I don't have this on my slide. Add that to your notes. It's important. What is your general impression of the patient? Now uh, we're ready for our rapid trauma assessment. That rapid trauma assessment is that shortened version of our question mark man that we'll see in a couple of slides that has C7 written on it and then an arrow pointing over the top of the head and then our little stick figure with arms and legs and MSC times four written there. That should sound familiar. We don't do the full meal deal physical examination when we're doing this rapid trauma. We're looking for life threats in this patient. What do we do? We palpate C7. Did that cause any pain? Then we, with gloved hands, we go around, up the neck, around the occipital skull, over the parietal skull. We put, we, we're feeling for crepitus. Are there skull fractures? Do we feel crunchy things there? Then we look at our gloves to see if there's any blood on our gloves. Yeah. Looking for those life threats with possible crushed skull. You, you'll Eventually, if you do this long enough, you will find one of those. Then we move down to palpate our patient's forehead. Now, I like to add in here just a quick pupil assessment. I'm not talking, taking a long time. Take your pen light, quickly look to see if your patient has equal pupils, if they're reactive, if they're symmetric. Do we have a blown pupil and a constricted pupil? Do we have pup two pupils that, rea that react sluggishly? Remember I told you yesterday that hypoxemia, hypoxic insult to the brain causes sluggish pupils. Those pupils will react slowly if if that person if that if that person's brain is hypoxic so look for those sluggish pupils we need to get aggressive with airway management and with ventilation if we find that okay now we're ready to move down the face we palpate to see if we find any facial fractures is the mandible fractured so we feel of that real quickly now we're looking at the neck. Is the trachea midline? That is an important piece of information. Are the jugular veins distended? Are they normal or are they flat? What does that tell us? Jugular vein distension can be an indication that our patient has a tension pneumothorax. That's important information. The brain that the, the blood that normally it drains down into the superior vena cava and moves into the right side of the heart to be circulated out to the lungs 
is there's there's some sort of pressure there's something in the chest preventing that blood from draining so you get you can get engorged jugular veins i mean take your thumb and imagine a thumb-sized jugular vein sticking up on each side of your patient's neck that's what i'm talking about an injury to the heart itself or an injury that causes bleeding into the pericardial sac around the heart that can put pressure on the heart cause distended jugular veins you'll learn how to assess all that you'll learn what that means as we move on through the semester okay now we've we're through with the neck let's palpate the neck on the way down we're feeling for subcutaneous emphysema that is the rice crispy crunchy feel that we find when there is air under the skin. Air is escaping in the chest and it makes its way up under the skin and you feel that rice crispy crunchy feeling. You'll know it the first time you feel it. You, you just have to imagine it now. Let's move down. We've moved down the neck. Let's palpate above the clavicles, the collarbones on each side to see if we find subcutaneous emphysema there, that rice crispy, crunchy feeling. Now let's palpate the clavicles. Are they intact or is there crepitus and deformity so that maybe we think that there's a fracture there. Now we're going to do take the edge of our hand, push down, we're going to put it down the length of our patient's sternum and press down we're looking for a sternal fracture do we feel does it feel strong and intact or do we feel crepitus that crunchy bone on bone feeling or do we what do we feel when we do that sternal fracture is a very serious finding okay this this happens so quickly that you can't believe it but we have to talk through it here in lab. Now we're going to assess the rest of the chest. Do I see rise and fall in the ch of the chest as my patient breathes? Is that symmetric? The same on both sides. Does one side inflate more than the other? Maybe one doesn't inflate at all. Very serious finding. Let's palpate the chest then. Let's determine if we find quickly find any gross fractures to the ribs. Uh, gross fractures, gross in patient assessment in medicine would mean, would mean obvious. So gross fractures. Do we find any gross deformity? Do we find any crepitus? That's all we're looking for. This is a good time to just pop your stethoscope on real quickly and see if the patient has equal breath sounds. I'm not taking a long time to assess them. I'm just taking a few seconds to listen to the apex, the apex, the base, and the base. Compare those bilaterally to see if they're the same. That's all I'm doing. Now my stethoscope's out of my ears, back around my neck. Now I'm ready to palpate the abdomen. What am I looking for? I'm looking for possible internal bleeding. Poss internal bleeding will c can cause discoloration. It can cause distension of the abdomen in, in the area of the bleeding. It also makes the, that abdomen really firm to palpate in the area where that blood is irritating the peritoneum, which lines the abdominal cavity. So what are we going to do? We're just going to feel the four quadrants comparing side to side. The way I do it is right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant, right lower quadrant. That is my normal pattern. Just, as long as you're comparing side to side, you do it however you feel like. It doesn't matter to me. After we've assessed the abdomen, we're ready to move down and assess the pelvis. Do we see any gross deformity again of the pelvis, of the pelvic area? Now we're ready to put hands on. We put each hand right over the greater trochanter of our patient on each side. We push in 
and down slightly. Not super hard. You're feeling to see if you feel any crepitus, if it feels unstable, and you're also determining whether that elicits a pain reaction from our patient. Okay, we've done that. Uh, let's say right now the pelvis is intact. We don't elicit any painful response. So our exam of the pelvis, checking for fractures is negative. That's a good deal. Now let's check the femurs. We're gonna check one leg from, from the proximal femur to the distal femur, uh, go to the knee. Uh, we're looking for life threats. Fractured femurs can cause massive blood loss. That can be a life threat, as can pelvic fractures. That is the reason for incorporating this in our rapid trauma. So we check, we palpate both legs, proximal to distal, femurs only, looking for those fractures that could be life threats. Now we've covered our rapid trauma, except we haven't assessed our patient's back, have we? By now, with a trauma patient, we are ready to log roll our patient onto a backboard. Before we do that, we have to have cervical collar on. We have one rescuer maintaining C-spine, not letting that move at all. That This log roll procedure requires the one person managing C-spine. We need two more people to do the log roll. And then you, as the clinician doing the patient assessment, you need to take your trauma shears, cut up the back of that person's clothing, pull it apart, and jump ahead a little bit and do your full DCAP BTLS assessment of that patient's back prior to log rolling them down onto the backboard. That's your one shot at assessing the back. Now we've done our rapid trauma plus assess the back. If we find life threats, we stop, we find them, we fix them, and we don't move on in this patient assessment algorithm until those life threats are managed. Okay. That is our primary survey. Uh, while we're doing this primary survey, in all likelihood, we've had someone else grab, uh, grab a set of vital signs for us. So by the time we finish this stuff, we should have additional information coming to us. Let's see what all we are lacking. Move to the next slide, hopefully. Okay. Is this trauma? Yes, we're going to go through this algorithm now. Vital signs. We have that person grabbing vital signs for us while we're doing all these other things that I just went through. We need a blood pressure. We need a heart rate. We need to know the rate, quality, and rhythm, not EKG rhythm. I'm talking, is it, is it regular? Is it irregular? Uh, is there some strange feeling pattern to it. Uh, so rate, quality, rhythm. Now we're gonna move down to the ventilatory rate. Everybody else calls that respiratory rate. We don't know yet if respiration is happening, right? But we know air is going in and out, hopefully. That's ventilatory, right? Ventilatory rate, uh, is that regular? Uh, other than counting the, the, the ventilations per minute, we also need to know if the respirations, that's easier for me to say, if the respirations are regular, depth, are they shallow, are they deep, are they normal? Are the respirations labored or are they non-labored? Is there a pattern to those, like the Shane Stokes pattern that we talked about yesterday in class? Temperature is my patient normal? Is my patient hot? Is my patient cold? That's all the temperature we're talking about here. Now SpO2, their saturated percentage of oxygen. Uh, how, how much the hemoglobin on the red blood cells, what is the percentage of saturation of those? Important information. We're going to get that SpO2 with that 
that finger clip or ear clip SPO2 uh, probe or connection and then our SPO2 monitor to get our SPO2. Uh, if protocol allows or if medical control gives you an order, getting a blood glucose level is extremely important. We have to poke a hole in somebody's skin to be able to use the glucometer, glucometer to get that blood glucose level. That is an invasive skill that requires, requires an order. It is within an EMT scope of practice if you have a protocol or if you have an order. Now we move on to end tidal CO2. This tells us about respiration. How well is gas being exchanged in the alveoli? What is the, what uh, in millimeters of mercury, what is the end tidal CO2 level? So uh, that is something that on a strictly BLS unit, you may not have the equipment that you need to do this. If you have it available, we're going to learn even more how to use this over the rest of this course. 35 to 45 millimeters mercury is the normal range for end tidal CO2. Again, that tells us at the alveolar level what kind of oxygen exchange we have. Uh, really, it's a, it's a much better indicator than SpO2, but SpO2 is very important. Now we're ready for a sample history. All of this is part of our secondary survey of our patient. S, signs and symptoms. What signs and symptoms does our patient have? Signs we see, those are objective things that we can see and measure. Symptoms are subjective. They're the things that our patient says they feel that they communicate to us. I feel nauseous. I feel like I'm going to puke feel like I'm going to die, I feel dizzy, I feel like my head's going to explode. Those are symptoms. I feel like an elephant sitting on my chest. Those are symptoms. So signs and symptoms. Now allergies. How do we get all this? We have to talk to our patient. We have to ask questions. Are you allergic to any medicines? No. M, medications. Do you take any prescription medicines? Or have you been prescribed any medications? Yes. What are they? They tell you. Write those down. How often do you take those? Have you taken those today? Uh, do you take any herbal supplements or anything of that nature? Yes, I take, I don't know, uh, hairy goat root nose hair. I don't know. There's all kinds of crazy stuff out there. Make a note of that. That can be important as far as interacting with medications that they might want to administer at the hospital. Your patient may be unconscious and unable to speak to him by the time you get to the hospital. You may be the only human who can elicit this information from your patient. So you have to do a good job of it. And then what over-the-counter medications do you take? Uh, all right, you have those down. Uh, now... Uh, P, past pertinent medical history. Not, I had my tonsils and adenoids out when I was five and your patient is 70. That's not past pertinent medical history. Is the, do they have a medical history that is related to what you're dealing with now? Uh, have you recently been admitted to the hospital? Uh, what were you in for? What did they do for you? How long ago did you get out? Uh, what did they say was wrong with you? Those kinds of things. Those are the questions you ask. Uh, they're going to want to tell you their history usually, especially old people. They want to tell you everything. So sometimes you have to cut them off and get the most important things. Uh, then last oral intake. What's, when's the last time you ate or drank? And what did you have? Uh, did you have any uh, any? Alcoholic beverages, that would be important, uh, depending on what kind of medications might be administered later. Last oral intake, uh, somebody having eaten or had something to drink prior to surgery can be extremely important for anesthesia purposes. If it's an emergent situation, they may just drop an NG tube 
and and evacuate the stomach and get everything out so that there's no risk during during the uh, administration of anesthesia. Uh, it could be that this isn't a big deal and we can wait to to reduce that fracture and in surgery and place a splint on that arm until we've had six or eight hours since the patient's last oral intake. Uh, so get a time on that and then events leading up to whatever happened. Let's have examples of that, buddy, because I don't know what you mean. Were you, did you pass out and cause you to wreck your car? Uh, did you, did you pass out and that caused you to fall and strike your head on the corner of the table so that now you have this, this, this 18 centimeter long laceration on your parietal skull uh, events leading up to uh, what were you doing when your chest started hurting? I was shoveling snow. Okay. They were, your patient was active when chest pain started. That's what we're talking about. For any pain that you find with your patient, we need some information about that. OPQRST, we need to know when the onset was. Then we need to know if anything provokes or palliates that pain. Provokes, you probably already know that. Does anything make it worse? Palliate, does anything make the pain better? Does it lessen the pain or make it go away completely? Quality, uh, is it a burning pain, a throbbing pain, an itching pain, pins and needles? Is it an ache? Uh, what is the quality of the pain? Does that pain move anywhere? Or does it stay in one place? Well, I don't see move anywhere or stay in one place on here. Radiate. A lot of people won't know what you mean when you ask them if their pain radiates. So you normally are going to ask if that pain in your right upper quadrant, does that move anywhere? Does it just stay in one place? Uh, just stays in one place. Or I don't know, it kind of I guess my shoulder hurts too, and and my back hurts. Okay, important information. Does that radiate or refer? Radiate would be chest pain, and that squeezing chest pain causes pain that moves up into the neck and down that left arm, and it seems like it comes in waves. That's radiation. So we have radiation and refer. They're together. Okay, now we're ready for S, severity, on the scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being no pain and 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt in your life. What would you say this pain is? It's subjective. They're going to tell you what they think, uh, and that is what you record. Patient states that pain is 9 on a scale of 0 to 10. That's how you document it. Okay, time. How long has this been going on? Onset, when did it start? T, time, how long has it been going on? You will get funny looks when you ask about onset. When did this pain start? When I fell down the steps and broke my leg is when it started. That's okay. Uh, that's You're interacting with your patient. You've established onset. Uh, sometimes I don't even ask about that. I know when onset was. I, did you have any pain before you fell down the stairs and and seemed to have fractured your femur here? Nope, no pain at all. Okay, we've, we've established onset. Let's move on. Now we're ready to do our full head-to-toe physical assessment of our patient. This is a hands-on thing, DCAP BTLS. We're going to talk a little more about it. First, we need to define what this acronym, acronym is. Can't make that one word, buddy. There's not a contraction for that. Okay, D, deformity, C, crepitus, A, abrasions, P, punctures or penetrations, B, burns, T, tenderness, L, lacerations, S, swelling. That's DCAP BTLS. So can I just look at my patient and determine if there's an issue with something in DCAP BTLS? Nope, this is the down and dirty, put your hands on uh, start. I start at C7. I palpate C7 again. 
Do you feel any pain there? Where is C7? Maybe we haven't really established that yet. Reach back with your hand to your neck. Follow it down midline till you find that first great big bump. That is your seventh cervical, cervical vertebra. And somebody with a spinal injury, that, that can elicit a lot of pain when you palpate that. Uh, now I'm ready to come back up over the head again. Check the head. We're palpating again. Feeling for deformity, crepitus, look, crepitus, looking for abrasions, looking for punctures and penetrations, looking for burns, feeling for tenderness. Do they say, ouch, that hurts? Or are they even more forceful than, than that? And they use profanity in combinations that you never could have imagined. You'll learn some cool combinations out here in the street. Are there lacerations? Do I find any of those? Do I see or feel any swelling? Uh, now we move down and check the orbits. Uh, do palpate for DCAP BTLS. Now we're back to the eyes. Let's use our pin light and let's... Oh, it's bright. They're outside. I can't even tell anything with this pin light. Use your other hand and shade their eyes like a little visor and and you may even have to open their eyes with your fingers while you do this and then use your pen light to see if that pupil reacts now move to the other one do the same thing do they react briskly do they react sluggishly we've already talked about what that means do they not react at all are they fixed and dilated? Extremely bad thing. That's how dead people's eyes are. Are they fixed and dilated? Uh, when we, uh, and then do we see, as we look at the eye, do we see like torn places on the eye with, with gooey gelatin looking stuff running out of the, the globe of the eye? Uh, does the the iris the color part is that round and regular or is that smeared and messed up on one side we're we're evaluating the eyes now we move on down palpate the rest of the face palpate the jaw have them squeeze their teeth together as hard as they can have them open their mouths look in their mouths uh, see if you see any broken teeth anything abnormal we're on the head. We have our pin light. Let's look in the ears. Do we see any uh, any any fluid coming out of the ears? What do we see there? If we see fluid coming out of the ears, we're going to take a four by four piece of gauze, get the fluid on it, lay it aside, and then we could put a loose dressing over that. If that separates out into a halo type pattern. That cerebrospinal fluid in our patient probably has a basilar skull fracture. Look in the nose. Do we see fluid running out of the nose? If it's kind of a, a watery, kind of a straw-colored fluid, that's what cerebrospinal fluid looks like. Uh, it might be kind of blood-tinged even coming out of the nose. Again, let's get some of that on a 4x4 four four piece of gauze. Set that aside. It takes a few minutes, maybe even five to ten minutes, possibly, for that to separate out into those concentric rings that that get lighter and lighter, and that that creates that halo pattern that I'm talking about. Again, you could have cerebrospinal fluid running out of the nose, running out of the ears. They could have it running down the back of their throat. They could tell you have a real sweet, weird taste, kind of a sweet, salty, weird taste in the in the back of my mouth. Well, that, they may have CSF running in there. Uh, we don't ever want to stop the flow of cerebrospinal fluid from the ears or from the nose. We're just going to jack the intracranial pressure up. So we put put a loose dressing over that ear to kind of catch that so it doesn't run everywhere. Same around the nose. That's it. Now, uh, while we're there and we're assessing the neck, different people do this different ways. Again, I'm going to check to see if that trachea is midline. I'm going to 
assess those those jugular veins. This is when I palpate the C-spine from top to bottom to see if there's any tenderness there. A lot of people do that do that full C-spine palpation when they are doing the, the C7 like I have on my diagram. No right and wrong there, just make sure it gets done. And we'll learn later what we're feeling for. Step-offs, deformities, that kind of thing. Vertebras that don't line up, uh, that's a bad thing. That could be a step-off. Uh, do we feel any crepitus? Uh, do we see deformity there? Of course, our patient is now now has a C collar around their neck, so we're not going to see deformity, right? Uh, but we can still palpate with that C collar in place. Now, uh, and with that C-collar in place, there's a hole in the front, so we can still visualize jugular distension, jugular venous distension, and we can visualize the trachea to see if it's midline. Now we're going to do our full assessment of the chest. Do we see equal rise and fall of the chest? Uh, yes or no? Uh, if no, then we're going to quickly file that away. Our patient may have a pneumothorax that they have air in their thoracic cavity that is compressing one of their lungs and keeping it from inflating. So that's that's what we're looking for. Uh, now we're ready to palpate the full chest. Palpate. I start at the sternum and work out on both sides, palpating the ribs to assess for any abnormalities in that DCAP BTLS list. Okay, I've done that. Now, I, while I'm doing that, go ahead and palpate deep up in each axilla, the armpit. I have found sub-Q emphysema there when I didn't find it at the clavicles or anywhere else in the chest. So push deep up there in the in the axilla on each side just to see if you might find some sub-Q air there, subcutaneous emphysema. Now we've made it down to the abdomen. We apply DCAP BTLS to the abdomen. We visualize it. Uh, is it distended? That would be deformity, right? Do we see above in the right upper quadrant uh, over the liver? Are we seeing distension and swelling there? Do we see discoloration there? That is important. Uh, and then the parts that are pertinent, we work through DCAP BTLS as we assess all four of our abdominal quadrants. What did I miss? I missed something. And you're probably biting your lip right now saying, dude, when are you gonna fully assess breath sounds? I know that's what you're saying. I didn't make that mistake on purpose. I wouldn't do it with a live patient, but while we're on that chest, we have to get our stethoscope back on, and we need to listen not just for equal breath sounds. We need to assess all of the fields, all of the lung fields, for unusual breath sounds. We'll learn next week, probably maybe the following week, what to listen for and what those unusual breath sounds are. But we need to listen those for those. Sometimes, quite often, we'll find those in one or two lobes and not find them anywhere else. So we have to fully assess, auscultate that entire chest. Uh, now we move on to the abdomen, which we've already done. So do it the same as you did. Now we move down to assess that pelvis again. Uh, we're not expecting to find anything, but go ahead and put a hand on each greater trochanter, palpate to see if if they feel any pain, uh, and you you follow your DCAP BTLS. Uh, do you see any deformity? Do you feel any crepitus? When you compress slightly, I'm not talking slam this two sides of their pelvis together and and see if you can make each side, each pubic bone line up with one another anterior to posterior instead of laterally. 
I, I'm talking just some firm pressure. If you feel crepitus, stop. If you feel instability, stop. That you've established that this patient probably potentially has a pelvic fracture, stop there. You don't want to destabilize that pelvis. Cause one of those sharp bone ends to lacerate femoral artery and have your patient bleed out right in front of you. So uh, that very important thing. Uh, and then we work on down DCAT BTLS there. Now we're going to follow the femurs down again, but we're going to go all the way on down the tibia, all the way down to the foot on one side, then on the other. We're always comparing side to side, looking for symmetry, looking for unusual things. And what do we use to follow? We have an acronym, right? DCAP BTLS. We're working through that with every region of the anatomy, with with all four extremities, with, with we're applying that to our entire patient. Sorry about that. Now we've made it down to the feet, right? While we're there, let's feel for the dorsalis pedis pulse on each side. Your patient is trauma stripped by now. They don't have socks and shoes on anymore. Again, I told you one way to find that dorsalis pedis pulse is start at the great toe, follow that tendon up. When you get about halfway up the arch of the foot, then start to feel for that pulse. Oh, I found it. What do I do? Take your ball port point pen or a sharpie, something that's not going to wipe away, that's not going to get smudged, that we're not going to lose, and put an X there so you know where to palpate the next time to find that pulse. We're going to establish if, if there are, are bilateral pedal pulses. Are they, are they strong? Are they weak? Is one absent? Uh, that's, that's what we're feeling for. Now that is circulatory in the feet. We're shooting for motor sensor, sensory and circulatory. Sensory, which toe am I touching on your right foot? Which toe am I touching on your left foot? That's sensory. Uh, go with an obvious toe, usually the big toe or the pinky toe. People don't always know what to call those three in the middle. So go with that go with go with those and and usually that works well now we have sensory and circulatory how are we going to evaluate motor let's put our hands on our patient's toes and have them push down like they're pushing pedals on a car at the same time push as hard as they can that's dorsal extension is that equal? Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it not there at all? That's You're assessing that. Uh, then you just move your hands over to the dorsal aspect of the foot. We move from the plantar aspect to the dorsal aspect. We have them pull their toes toward their head as hard as they can. This is dorsal flexion. And again, we're failing to see if we have equal dorsal flexion, if we have weak dorsal flexion, or if we have absent dorsal flexion on one side or the other. Now we've done motor sensory circulatory times two, but I wrote on my slide motor sensory circulatory times four. Now I come up and assess the arms. So I palpate, starting at the shoulder, I palpate the humerus all the way down, palpate the radius and ulna, I'm, I'm assessing DCAP BTLS. That is what we do with everything. I've done one arm. Now I'm going to palpate the other arm, starting at the, the head of the humerus, working down to the elbow that covered the humerus, then down the radius and ulna. Now palpate those wrists bilaterally. Usually I do those at the same time. If they wince, which one hurt? Uh, how did it hurt? What did it feel like? Now I can focus in on that in a minute. Now I'm ready to do motor sensory and circulatory, right? Right there by the wrist, let's pop over and let's grab bilateral radial pulses again. Are they still present? 
are they weak? Are they strong? Are they are they bounding? Uh, that's that's what we're looking for for circulatory. Now motor. Uh, let's s stick our fingers like handlebars into our patient's palms and have them grip our hands with their fingers as hard as they can, both sides at the same time. We're assessing to see if they have equal grips, if it's stronger on one side than the other, or if it's absent. That assesses, that assesses motor. Now let's pick a pinky finger or an index finger. Do you feel that? What finger am I touching? Do you feel that? What finger am I touching on your left hand? Now we've done motor sensory and circulatory times four. Oh, I can't find a radial pulse. I need to now, let's do capillary refill real quick. Let's pinch that nail bed, release, and in the time it takes us to say, takes us to say capillary refill, which is two seconds, we can determine if that patient has intact circulation to that finger. Now we have done our full secondary assessment and uh, we are, if we have a non-critical patient, maybe we did all this on the scene. Now we're ready to get on the road. If we had a critical patient, we did that primary and we've done all the rest of this as we're bouncing down the road. So everything before this slide would have been done and, and possibly we got vital signs, at least blood pressure, heart rate, and ventilatory rate and temperature we got on scene and, and now we're ready to roll to the hospital if we have a critical patient. Non-critical, we have some time to stay in play and do all this full assessment. Critical patient, am I always going to get this full secondary detail survey done? It goes a lot quicker than my, my stinking slideshow here. Uh, you do this quickly. You've been doing it lab. You're doing it well. You understand that this can be done quickly. Talking about it takes a lot longer. Okay, uh, we may not ever get to this. We may not be able to get a sample history. Our patient may be unconscious and we can't get sample or OPQRST. Uh, we, we're trying to deal with life threats. So we're, we're, our patient is bleeding out. We're trying to, we have a tourniquet on. They're still, they're in hemorrhagic shock. They're trying to crash on us. We're doing positive pressure ventilations. We're busy, 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 and we don't get, other than our rapid trauma, we don't get a physical exam done. That is okay, but you need to communicate to the hospital what you were doing and why you didn't get that done, and you need to document why you didn't do this full secondary survey. Okay, now we're probably ready uh, for some interventions, we may already have some interventions going. We already may already be doing positive pressure ventilations. Uh, and now we're ready to reassess. When does reassessment happen? What did we establish in our full lecture? We, uh, we reassess every five minutes for critical patients, every 15 minutes for non-critical. We assess before and after interventions and we reassess our patient starting over with the pertinent parts of the primary survey if we have a change in our patient's condition. Medical assessment. Up here, was it trauma? Not a chance. Things are a little bit different. Uh, oh, I had a note there again. Remember, medical issues can lead to trauma, so Keep that in the keep that filed away in your mind, uh, and then uh, what is different about medical? We talk about onset of signs and symptoms. The last time our patient was known to be normal, what the heck is that? If your patient is having signs and symptoms of of a stroke, 
of an ischemic stroke, a blocked off artery in their brain, a, a, a thrombus in a, cere in a cerebral artery, whether or not they can receive clot busters to try to open that up and reverse the effects of that stroke are determined by the time that has passed since the onset of symptoms. So we need to know the last time that patient was known to be normal. And when we get a history of the present illness with our medical patients, it is the who, what, where, when, why, how game regarding their signs and symptoms, all of those things. Has your patient had any loss of consciousness? If yes, did they fall? We need to add a trauma assessment. If no, then we go back through pertinent parts of our secondary survey. We're going to get our vital signs, get a sample history, apply OPQRST, and then we still do a full head-to-toe physical exam of our patient. Uh, then we can do a focused assessment of what their problem is. Reassessment. Let's talk about reassessment a little more, then we'll wrap this up. Critical patients, we reassess every five minutes. Non-critical, we reassess every 15. A with the line over it before, P with the line over it after. Before and after any intervention, we reassess our patient. Anytime there's a change in our patient's condition, we reassess our patient. Oh, that's good. What do we reassess? We repeat the pertinent portions of our primary survey. What is their, the status of their airway, their breathing, their circulation, uh, their level of consciousness? Are they alert and appropriate? Do they only respond to verbal now, only respond to painful? Are they now unresponsive? That is what we're talking about there. Uh, we repeat vital signs every time. Heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, blood glucose level, uh, SpO2, end tidal CO2, and, and temp. Heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. We're going to trend those vital signs. We can look back over what those, what those values were each beginning with our baseline, which is that initial set, and then each reassessment is that blood pressure going down, the heart rate going up. Is the respiratory rate going up? Is it all staying where it was at the baseline? And then we repeat our focused assessment. Patient has an isolated mid-shaft fra fractured femur, and we've applied a traction splint. We're, we're going to assess that traction splint. Is that intervention still tight so that it's providing traction? Does our patient still have good distal motor sensory and circulatory? We're going to reevaluate and provide that focused assessment on our patient's injury. And always we're going to we're going to reassess motor, motor sensory and circulatory times four. Keep an eye on that. And if you have a restrained patient, we're always going to reassess motor sensory and circulatory every five minutes. And that would include a patient who is handcuff, in handcuffs and in police custody. Patient on a backboard. Is, backboard is a splint, so we need to... We need to assess motor, sensory, and circulatory times four every time we reassess that patient on the backboard, uh, check distal pulses, uh, if there's any bandaging or splinting in place, and that is reassessment. In summary, the purpose of this algorithm is to provide a systematic approach to assessing every patient. If you master this and you can apply it to take it from your, take your knowledge from your head to your hands and apply that to your patient and uh, determine what life threats are to your patient and treat those or what medical needs your patient has and treat those, then it, congratulations, you are a clinician. Uh, obviously, the key is to quickly assess patients, find and fix life threats, gather pertinent information for managing your patient and for Communic communicating that to the receiving facility when 
you transfer care from you to the, the emergency department or whoever takes over your patient from you. With experience and the education you'll gain in this course, you'll be able to internalize this, personalize this algorithm, and put it to use in your practice as an EMT. Uh, another important thing with memorizing and mastering this algorithm, it improves your critical, your critical thinking skills. It's absolutely necessary for your academic success. Uh, if, you, if you reduce this algorithm to writing on one page, I will give you permission to use that on every exam you take. Memorize that algorithm. When you go take your national registry, you can't haul anything in with you, but you have scratch paper or a dry erase board. Immediately write your patient assessment algorithm down, all the moving parts of it. And then when you find a scenario question, just like you did during my exams, you can use your patient assessment algorithm to work through or apply critical thinking skills to that scenario to reach the proper answer. And finally, this is indispensable in the street. This uh, patient assessment is one of the biggest difference between a good clinician and a bad clinician. We're all gonna be good clinicians. Learn this thing, uh, apply it to your classroom learning, apply it to your exams, apply it to your national registry, then take it to the streets. All right, thank you.